Uh, thank you. So sorry it wasn't planned before, but uh, I hope you enjoyed. And it's just kind of what we're what we're doing. So you have some ideas from from across the pond. Um, so maybe it's interesting, maybe not. And uh, we also wrote <laughs> a line of sight tool, and also <laughs> which, which I'll show you. But um, and we have. Uh, I mean, I'll get it to at the end, but we have a 3D one that's coming up right now, also uses LiDAR data and GIS data. We also use PostGIS, and we have thousands of panoramas that uh, we don't have a tool that you can click on. So like yours is a super good addition, <laughs> Leonardo's is a super good addition, and maybe you'll like what we have as well, and you could take it. Uh, so I think that's cool. Anyway, we're a community network in New York. Um, so New York, City, we're, New York City Mesh, we're in New York. Um, I assume most of you know where that is. It's uh, about 10 million people in the area, plus or minus, um, which makes it kind of a really densely populated area that has lots of things, lots of internet and so on. However, but um, almost all the copper lines are dead. Uh, the cable company is bankrupt, and the fiber company is a monopoly in probably a quarter of the buildings, and that's it. So it's kind of a, a small wasteland of, of internet, even though people are really wealthy and it's a very populated area. So it's kind of a confusing mix. Uh, our goals are to connect the unconnected, um, provide choice so people can choose what they want to do with their, their, net, their network and not be stuck with one of the options or no options, and make it so that members can kind of know the entire path to the internet or to other members uh, from their own perspective, uh, provide offline and online use, and for fun and development and education. So um, about three years ago, it kind of looked like this. Uh, there were a small handful of nodes in one block, and that was about it. The project started maybe eight years ago, and it was just Wi-Fi routers on tables, and it didn't really put anything outside until about three years ago. Um, two years ago, we had about 90 nodes online and one and a half super nodes, and our map looked like this, which is a bit of a mess. Um, and then we nearly doubled in size in that year. So we went to about 150 nodes. And we started this concept called hubs, which are like uh, medium-sized buildings that have some antennas so you can jump over the neighborhoods, over the valleys of tall buildings. Um, and today we have about 340 nodes online, 25 of these hubs, and two full super nodes. Um, and it's kind of growing in this circle around the bottom of Brooklyn coming back up, we hope. Uh, what can you do with it? You can get to the internet. You can also use offline apps, uh, whatever it is that you want to do offline. Um, all IPs in the network can talk to each other. It's a routed network, so it's kind of like a giant campus network for the city, um, for everybody. Um, there's various things in the mesh. We have a secure scuttlebutt. There's a DNS zone that's by uh, a Git repo in any cast. Anyone can claim a zone. We have a chat system um, that's peer-to-peer. Um, or node to node, if you will. Um, and then people's laptops can connect to some number of nodes and broadcast messages through. We have a logical map that shows the topology that's rewritten, not using anything that's already been used. So kind of a, a new creation that's not yet published because the code's so bad so far. Uh, and I, I'm creating a multi-gigabit internet speed test server that you can use from your browser or from an app. And you can test to a node and kind of have uh, blocking tests that people don't overlap their tests simultaneously so that you don't have like a, a fake speed test speed. Uh, also not published yet, but they, these are all intended to be public. Um, our working style is we have many small groups that work on things. Um, there is no overarching master uh, hierarchy. It's, it's individual people doing ad hoc things. Um, they get into one of the chat channels and say, you know, they want to work on websites or the BGP working group or you know, we've installed teams that are five, you know, three to five people that go out, and there's a member of those teams um, outreach, and every neighborhood kind of coordinates their own their own plan. In terms of money, it's pay what you want. Um, we recommend twenty dollars a month if you find it useful, which is significantly lower than any commercial option. Um, but some pay more or less. Some people pay five times that, and some pay nothing. Um, we also recommend that the, or we, we ask that the owner of the node that's on their building, they, they own the node, we don't own the node, uh, we aren't anybody. Um, so they buy the equipment, which is 100 to $200 typically, um, and you can do an installation yourself without asking anybody, or you can join a chat and talk about it and do it yourself, or you can ask people to come 
uh, have like a volunteer install party at your house, and you could do that. And all the above are flexible. Um, if you say you want a node and you can't afford it, we'll do it anyway. Or if you want to sign up and pay the hundred dollars for the equipment, but you don't want to pay the monthly bill, that's fine. Uh, it has no relation to what service you get of any kind. We also received a few grants in the past. We had 30k from ISOC for the Beyond the Net. This this launched our Supernode One. It also paid for the full first year of the Supernode One uh, rent for the for the rooftop space on this tall building that I'll show you later. And um, this really kind of launched the network from being in one block to across the city. Uh, it also bought a number of the first antennas, so that kind of launched the first nodes that were in the area and just handed people antennas and said, "Here, do what do what you want with it." Uh, we also got 10k from Mozilla. Uh, this built the Saratoga Housing Project Network, which is this building in um, Brooklyn, if you want, maybe Brooklyn Queens area on the border. Uh, it's a, a New York City Housing Authority project, so it's low-income housing uh, that's assigned to you by the state uh, after you apply. And we were granted access to this building uh, onto this water tower that's on the top. And um, you can we put antennas there, and we provide access to some parts of the building as much as we can, various public areas and hallways and stuff like that, and um, access to this train station as well as all the parks around it. Um, so it's again low income. The cable is okay in the in the building; it kind of works, but the phone is uh, completely gone, and uh, most people in the building can't afford net, and so they sometimes use this, or sometimes don't use anything, or their phones. Um, this building today, after uh, a year and some after the project um, went underway, it touches about 50 buildings and it passes through eight other hubs, um, feeding, you know, not just feeding them, but they feed it as well, depending on the direction of the net. And it continuously serves about 100 to 150 megabits of, of net of, of usage. It has more than that uh, available to it. Um, and before and after that project, this is kind of the span that really. Um, jumped in, in the, Brook, the Brooklyn, Bushwick, Bedford area. Um, and today it's, gro it's grown even further and it's extended down to even a, a school and uh, these hubs around it, which have their own span. Um, we, we have a network commons license, which is similar to the Geefy Compact or the Free, uh, Free Network Foundation network commons license. And basically it says that you can't sell this network. This is free access to you. You're extending it the same way that you received it. You can't prevent anyone from using it. You can't stop anyone. And it's your, it's your duty to extend the network if you can. Uh, basically, all the things that we all kind of already agree. Uh, but it, it shows the people that this is a, a new thing that they're agreeing to, or this is a new kind of network for them. Uh, typical installation kind of looks like this. Um, we might have something like an omnidirectional antenna, uh, or an omni with a bunch of other antennas that create a small hub. Um, or just a point-to-point, -point, or maybe a nano station running OpenWRT with another antenna. Um, we, you know, also typically will install in a building and run many wires down the side to apartments. Uh, we even have this kind of install manual that somebody made very nicely that shows people the different components um, and illustrates the fact that it's a mesh where people connect rooftop to rooftop and some have additional point-to-points out, depending where you. Can. It is, yeah. I, it's. Um, we have some really beautiful documentation. And it's, lots of people are in our group, and they have various skills, and people like this. We have some videos and animations, too, which is fun. Yeah. Looks like an IKEA, IKEA number. It's, it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's like a kind of a joke. Um, but it's also, you know, uh, you know yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's the goal is IKEA manual, yeah. yeah. Um, I mentioned Omnis earlier. We, you know, in order to really ensure that we are doing rooftop to rooftop communication, uh, we pushed heavily to do uh, this omnidirectional antennas. We have about 48 today. And so even that hub, that tall building that has 50 buildings connected, it has another 30 omnis where you can go rooftop to rooftop, but you can go express to the tall building, or you can go backwards down the mesh the other direction. So um, we show all the routes through all paths to everybody. And you know, omnis obviously have a lower quality than a point to point, so we degrade those routes. but um, there are people who, in the middle of uh, a block, will use some omnis to jump to another omni. Um, in fact, uh, yes? Can you go back to the, uh, what's the distance between the Supernode 4 and the... Uh, this one? Yeah. Well, that's just understand. 
four kilometers? No, these are these are pointing the omnis out, but the lines are uh, point to points. Okay. Yeah. And I just wanted to illustrate like the the layout of the omnis and how they're kind of densely clustered so that you can you can go omni to omni. You would go just between say these ones or those ones and then and, and route around. So if there's an outage, you can still go. You know, so it's a mesh in that sense. Um, and so in, in this sense, we, we have kind of this dual mode architecture. Some people say that we look like an ISP. Some people say that we look like a mesh. Um, we're, we're neither or both. I don't know, depending on what you like to say. We have elements of both of the styles so that we can uh, be very open and grow quickly and have high quality and high bandwidth, but also uh, get into the valleys of the different parts of the city and uh, enable people to just put an antenna on their rooftop immediately without asking anyone and join the network uh, directly. So you can extend it as, as freely as possible. So basically, yes. it depends on the crawl heights. Um, so they first jump on the omnis, and then they get to the point of reference. Yes. Up. Yeah, so we, we think that people should jump probably a couple hops on the omnis. Yeah. Um, I actually have an illustration a little bit later, uh, but you know, you don't want to jump 10 hops on an Omni, nor you want to do even 10 hops on a single radio sector antenna. It's not fun. So, but if you jump one or two, then it's not, it's not awful. You'll still get many, many megabits, you know, versus like a dedicated 300 is silly. And, yeah. and the Omni islands, they're, they're stop networks. So you cannot place another point to point getting out of the Omni. No, you can, yeah. So you, you allow this? Yes, yeah. It, it's uh, any, any topology, any direction you could put two omnis, you can have a, a series of, or you can put two point-to-points and two omnis, you can put a series of omnis, you can put point-to-points in the middle, or point-to-point to, point to an omni and then other point-to-points out of it. We allow all of them. You just have to maybe change the cost of your network to be appropriate for the, for the topology. Um, so, so there, there is no difference from the, the let's say, the core network and, and the omni stops. No. They're just changing the technology. It's not like a community that owns or manages that piece of the network. It's just a technological choice that is more convenient. In yeah, it's just a different antenna, just different path, just different radio type, right? There's no, there's no uh, backbone network and not backbone network. It's not a, it's not a federation where we give something to the little guy. It's if you can make a link across the water, that's a bad link, low quality. It's a valid backbone link. It's a valid link, and it'll just might you won't select it because it's low cost, right? Because it has or a bad cost. Yeah, okay, so you choose a metric. You choose a metric. We have a lot of defaults that are we found to be pretty good, okay. um, but you can you can change it if you think it's really bad. You know, some people say like they have a ten thousand metric because they they never want that link to be used, <laughs> but you know it's that's silly, but it happens. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, so the the Omni also have a uh, ad hoc. Yeah, they are in ad hoc mode. We're we're using it in WDS mode. WDS okay. on a bridge, filtering any forwarded traffic on the bridge, so that there's no. It doesn't. It has to touch the routing part of the antenna, and then be directed back out rather than touch the bridge and be forwarded. So we don't have layer two broadcast that's polluting the Omni. Uh, zone, right? It's just a way for the packets to get into the air and then go over and come back out on the other side. So we just use it kind of like a, a physical layer, where it's it's pseudo broadcast. And and which routing protocol are you? Uh, using? Well, there's an, I think it's in the two oh, slides, okay, but uh, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, um, yes. So just a little bit more about the omnis. Uh, why, why Omni, we all know, is not the best, um, but we, we switched to a new router model. We were looking for a new router that had the right number of ports outside, did PoE, it was waterproof, it had more than five ports, it, it, all this stuff. And we were using kind of a ubiquity uh, edge point. And you, know, you can see it here, it's, it's like fairly low capability, whatever that means, it's a, a non, <laughs> there's no unit, um, but its price is pretty low. And we found that for kind of the same price or like a nice linear markup, you can go get this next antenna, which has more capabilities, it's faster, it's, it breaks less, has more ports for about the same price, but you get kind of a free extra AP. And with our goal of like allowing people in the street to be able to connect to it, if they pass by on an open access point or anyone in apartments that are nearby, we thought 
yeah, like let's let's do omnidirectionals instead. Um, so we we see it firstly as a router that has the right parameters, but then also you get a free access point. So if you have a free access point, you might as well make an omni network. So this we know this is not the best, but again, it creates kind of a base layer where uh, we can get like a nice coverage over a region without um, you know without forcing you to only join that and have purely low bandwidth, right? So maybe you'll do a couple hops on an Omni and then hit a point to point. Um, for example, these two, uh, this line right here is not actually a point to point, it's an Omni to Omni, um, it, even though it shows a blue line like it's a point to point. So these three are point to points into different hubs uh, and there's three Omnis in a row here uh, within a few blocks. You can see the signal is negative 55. Uh, it's 802.11 AC, so it's multi-channel and we see the channels varying themselves, and the, even with a short guard interval, and it kind of goes up and down. So even if even if a user connects very poorly with their cell phone, um, you know, because it has to take the packet in and retransmit it through the routing engine, it might rate back up to the next to the next omni. So when you're having the bandwidth, you're not having a small number; you're having a fairly sizable number, multiple hundreds of megabits. And so we can we can achieve two hops away with signal quality like this with few block distance, you know, 50, 60 megabits um, to the next Omni. So, um, so, so yeah. on the Omnis, like running WDS, can you just connect a phone and it will work? Or? Yeah, we oh, have, oh, we have multiple nice. virtual access points. We yeah. have um, a, a unencrypted one that has the same SSID for the whole city. Um, we have a second one, which is an encrypted one with a password that everybody knows and we publish. Um, but it has the, the, num the node number on it. So if you want to connect to that node and you want to be encrypted, you can do that, right? Uh, so it just prevents people from drive by and do something weird, right? Um, and then the third SSID we broadcast is the WDS SSID. It has no DHCP. You can't connect it with your laptop. It's omni to omni only. Oh, yeah, okay. So but it's all on the same radio. Yeah, you have different SSIDs for yeah. cli clients and for the mesh part. That's yeah, just yeah. because one has DHCP, the other one is not doing DHCP. It's just it's running USPF. Oh, sorry. sorry. I, yeah. No, go ahead. No, it's running the, yeah, the routing protocol. Yeah, it's the routing protocol only. Yep. Okay. So that's kind of what it looks like. And we have, uh, we also use this for, say, a, a block association. Uh, here's a block that has four Omnis and I think three people in each building. And two of the buildings have links out. The blue lines that go across are just artifact. Um, and the Omnis in the area uh, just see each other and they mesh. So someone else, when they add another building to the association here, they could just put another Omni. And we've, we have a density of Omnis now that we can do that. If you're within a block or two of an Omni, you can just put one more and you don't have to really have an additional point to point. So the, co the per node cost is lowering uh, for us or it's flat-ish, it's not increasing. Um, so we use OSPF, um, <laughs> why? <laughs> uh, we, we do this because we wanna use a standard protocol that's open on all hardware. And so we see this as actually a more open choice than selecting any one routing protocol. Um, it, we want obviously neighbor discovery and scalability, um, but it's also very important to us about this open hardware choice. And so we can select Ubiquity, we can select Microtik, we can select a Linux box, OpenWRT, Bird, FFR, whatever you want, and the network will still function. Um, and we've had some trouble in the past where um, like a certain routing protocol will have uh, a minor bug, and then we have to kind of basically climb trees, right, or figure out what's going on, and um, we just want it. We just want it to route. Um, so the OSPF being a standard since a long time now, we can use it on Cisco switches or anything. Any box you can find or get donated will will run it. We also have others. We have um, a small BMX six cluster. We also have BGP on the mesh. And um, we do BGP between some of the bigger nodes, between some of the, the super nodes and hubs. Um, so might be a little contentious, but like it's just another, it's just another shortest path protocol. Right? So. Uh, how many nodes did you have for the SPF? Two hundred fifty, two hundred. That's not the biggest. Um, the CT wag in South Africa has a thousand. And um, it should be able to do that much. Uh, they, are they all in the same area? Or? Yes, we use only the we only use the <laughs> yeah we, we use the backbone area, the zero area, and we use point to multi point mode. 
So every, which might be a little bit high in overhead because every node uh, shows itself as the next hop. But that's good because we do this non-broadcast domain with WDS and filtering. But even on uh, the wired network, you can plug two nodes together with a wire and put it into the mesh bridge. And that also has bridge filtering. So you're not, you're not polluting your neighbor. Uh, you're only going, you're seeing it as just a, like a point-to-point -point topology to another routing engine that's nearby. Um, you can turn that off, of course, and, and do uh, not bridge filtering. And we do that some places when we have like five antennas with a small switch. We put them all on there, and they can route directly through on a layer two without having to retransmit. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what hardware do we use? Uh, we have all kinds of different brands. We're using approximately five different Microtik models, eight different Ubiquity models, some Mimosas. Uh, we have... I know OpenWRT is not a brand, but we have probably five different models running OpenWRT, uh, mostly desktop models, but also nano stations and uh, similar outdoors. Uh, we also use like Linux boxes uh, very heavily for routing. Uh, almost all of our uh, super nodes are are just Debian on servers with network cards, you know, and, and IP tables uh, and Bird and uh, switches. We have like some nice donated Cisco Nexus switches that we use just for for layer two. 40 gig, <laughs> 10 and 40, yeah. And uh, whatever we find. So we're very happy to receive donations, so we don't mind about acquiring things like that. Um, um, we run a public network as well at, we, at public ASN. Um, our, we peer openly with whoever wants to peer. Uh, we're on Internet Exchange, and there are about five local ISPs that donate BGP full table transit to us. So we don't pay for transit at all. And uh, by policy, we just don't do that. We, we see ourselves as a, a donated goodwill community network type thing that's downstream. Uh, and we're not selling anything. So if somebody wants to donate to us, that's, that's nice. Um, so they're, they're local corporate business ISPs that have uh, management that's kind of like, your, your project's really cool. We like it. And so they say, yeah, just pass some traffic through us. Um, so. Um, we, we do this because we want to have a neutral network for our members, uh, obviously cheap free transit, and I th we think it's important to be part of the internet uh, as an aut autonomous system, uh, and so on. Uh, and this spans across two sites where we have fiber in each site separately. Um, one of the sites is our Supernode 1. It's 171 meters tall. It's an old telephone building that was that's now a data center. Uh, we lease um, a very small space on the roof and uh, have some rack space. Here we have an uh, exchange connection providing public exit, um, servers for all kinds of mesh things, dashboarding and stuff like that, about seven antennas pointing in various directions. Uh, we also do a VPN exit, kind of like a Freifunk Rhineland type of thing, you can VPN in, and we run a write probe. Uh, this one's doing about 500 megabits. Um, it's not its limit, that's just what it does on a day randomly. We also have Supernode 3, which is in the old shipping yard. It's now an industrial building with a data center. It's around 50 meters tall. And uh, we have a 40 gigabit donated uh, transit there. Um, we're also about to get a 40 gigabit donation at the first site. It's just cross-connect problems for the moment. Um, but here we also have servers. Um, but we make a little bit bigger rooftop presence where we have three big poles that you can mount any antenna point to point sector. And so we kind of have carved out space for the future, which uh, should really boost that area. And we also put two 10 gigs to the roof. So we can, um, we're not really worried about any problems like that. Uh, we also, same VPN and RIPE, but we add a community, co community server co-location project where you as a member can put your server there if you want and pay what you want. Uh, we're recommending about $50 a U per month. And you're not allowed to use it for commercial purposes like uh, web hosting or selling VPS or whatever. It's just, it's purely for members who want to put a server. And we support, you know, whatever wire you want, copper, fiber, any speed you want, BGP if you want, public IP, private IP, it doesn't matter. Cool. Uh, we also create, uh, now here's the fun part. Um, so we, we started doing line of sight type tools. Uh, we wanted a very nice, easy one for people that, that come to and say, I don't know what my building can see or what your nodes are, even though they have the whole map. And so you can just type your address, push the button, and it estimates for you probably if you can see it and about how far it is. 
Um, and if and if not, why not? How many intersections is it? This is it's used as PostGIS and uh, the New York City public databases, which they also give from the city data. It's open. Here's the the link to the code. Um, but we wanted to take this a little bit farther because this is a this building's really close to one of our big sites, so it obviously works. But um, on some buildings, it shows something like one intersection, three intersections, 19 intersections. And so it doesn't really, uh, like you think you might get it, you might not. And so you might want to see why is it that it thinks that you can't connect. And so we'd start developing a 3D version of it, which um, uses the, the building database from New York City. Um, we're trying to include the LiDAR data, but this is all um, directly written. It uses the same exact data as the previous tool, but it lays it out using um, using like a canvas and, uh, and JavaScript um, directly from the, the raw files, or, or like a, a derived version of the raw files. Um, the idea is that we, we have this really large Google Earth KMZ file to, to do this rooftop to rooftop, kind of put a line through and see what happens, um, because we want to be able to kind of, you know, there's a lot of trees and so on, but there's also buildings that are growing all the time, and we just don't know when they pop up. So. Um, so we wanted to be able to do the map in 3D, um, but have it be the same data as the line of sight tool. But moreover, when the line of sight shows that there should be a link, we want to be able to click on it and say, show me the link. Show me what it looks like and, or why you think it's not going to, why, why it intersects. And so we can just jump to the link itself and visualize it directly. So this is a work in progress. Um, the code is somewhere on our GitHub, but I don't know. It's a bit of a mess. Um, but it's being worked on actively, and you can use it right now if you want to. We lastly have a configuration generation tool, uh, which uh, allows you to select a, kind of a version of a configuration for any model of antenna that we've used before. Um, this, is a, this is a little page that um, opens up a Git repo that has config templates, and it will, allow you, it will search for variables in the config template and allow you to fill in the variables and download a file so that if you're on a rooftop and you have all the equipment, but you want to you want to like just do a quick initial installation, you can click the button, and it will give you um, a configuration for your node number that will that will work the first time. So installations look like this. We have installations that are near train stations uh, with open WRT gear on trees. Um, we have uh, this built on the. On the left, this is a, a Chinatown installation where people just strap together some switches on the roof. We have solar panel installations. We have 60 gigahertz on the city hall building. Um, so we kind of do whatever box we can and whatever model we can. And that's it, I think. Yep. That's the last slide. Thank you. Thanks. Yep.